there are so many things in this world and I'm no expert in any way in any of these things, but maybe I know something that I'd like you to also try to learn something about. Maybe you've never come across such a, a thing. For example, this one, uh, the one uh, I, I recommended a reading today, uh, I'll talk about that. That's just something that I come across during the week that I felt, oh, this is interesting and maybe you would like to know. So that's what I'm doing here. And of course, everybody, if you want to practice your speaking in English, you should try every opportunity to speak something. Uh, so I will welcome everybody to make any comment or suggestion or uh, ask questions. Okay, so today I am talking about April Love because the other day my sister mentioned that Pet Boon song and I thought, oh, I haven't thought about this song for decades, maybe half a century. <laughs> so, so I picked this song and I matched it with a very common poem by Du Mu. Huh? He's also from Tang Dynasty, but a little later. So he was called the Xiao Du because he's after Du Fu. And sometimes people call him Xiao Li Du. Uh, I mean, he's one of the Li Du. Uh, when we say Li Du, we always mean Li Bai and Du Fu. But when we say Xiao Li Du, that would be Du Mu and Li Shangyin. So these two poets who are very loved by people, they came much later in Tang Dynasty. And we're also going to talk about habitat because we were talking about ecosystems and a spectrum and Mesopotamia and moonshine. These are words that I talked about recently and I thought I would expand on them and talk a little more about them. And for once, uh, my vocabulary from last week had nothing highlighted in red. So I luckily did not spell anything wrong last week. So we're going to move on. But before that, I'm going to talk about this article that I recommended you to read. Uh, it is what I read two days ago uh, in Times Magazine. It's about how China could change the world by taking meat off the menu. By taking meat off the menu means by going vegetarian. Uh, now that China is much wealthier than before, the Chinese people are eating a lot of meat in this world. And uh, it's kind of a, a dangerous thing because so many people started to eat so much meat and the buy so much meat and uh, making the world produce so much meat, it's a very dangerous thing. But luckily, as this person wrote, he thought it's a good thing because, uh, because Chinese probably will not eat so much meat. That's an interesting article about the vegetarian food industry, the restaurants, the meat producers, how this trend is going about going vegetarian. And uh, uh, that would make a light reading in the night when you go to bed and uh, after you check all the line messages, you would have something entertaining to read. And in reading this article, which is uh, not too long, not too short, uh, I found three things that are uh, quite new and unique. One is unicorn, one is flexitarian, and another is a different concept, which is cultured meat. Uh, probably everybody has heard about a unicorn. That is a horse with a, a horn on top of the forehead that is almost like a sword. It's very long in this very old, uh, painting. I think it's a painting. I've seen uh, unicorns in a tapestry. There is a, a museum in Paris 
the city of Paris in France, their capital, and the, this uh, medieval stuff museum is called Cligny, and they have their this museum is famous for having six or seven tapestry of unicorn with a lady. Oh, maybe next time I can show you the pictures. I was there probably three, four years ago with my friend and we went to Paris a week ahead of our cruise. We participated in the Grand Circle cruise and we were there one week early. So, and it happens to be, we started the trip on the first day of March which means that we were born to hit a first Sunday of the month, which is a free museum day. So on that free museum day, which was maybe March the 4th or something, within that week that we got there early, we, are, we were able to hit three big museums without having to pay for the admission. So that was one of the museums we went to. Uh, we went to the Louvre the, the day before uh, we could we wanted to go there again but we did not use our uh, very precious free museum day on the Louvre because if we go there we would spend a whole day there and that would mean that we saved the 17 or 18 euros by going there on the free day. However, we went to three smaller museums instead, and each one would have charged us something like $18 or 15 euros. So we saved three times that much on free museum day. So if you go to Paris, make sure that you would hit a first Sunday of the month and make your plan very well so that you could hit as many museums as possible and easily save you $100. So this is unicorn uh, with a painting. And what does this mean? Unicorn is a legendary animal. It does not exist. People imagine there is a beautiful, usually a white horse with a unicorn with one horn on top of the head. Uh, so this does not exist. And the people imagine such an animal to be beautiful, magical, uh, and all the best things in the world, pure and the kind uh, or whatever they could think of. So that's a unicorn. So what do we mean by unicorn when it comes to uh, vegetarian food. Uh, well, uh, it's not about vegetarian food. Uh, unicorn in finance is in business is, is a, a magical, very rare thing that a privately held startup company valued at over $1 billion. Well, we know there are hundreds if not thousands or even millions of startup companies in the world. Many of them died quickly and uh, most of them could not, uh, to begin with, go on New York Stock Exchange or whatever stock exchange to put their stocks on the market for people to buy in order to uh, raise funds. So they would usually go to a venture capitalist. A venture capitalist, oh, here is a, <laughs> the word venture, okay. Venture capital company. Uh oh, oh my God, I should hit the wrong key. Capital. Oh, I'm back to Chinese again, okay. A venture capital company is a company that would uh, help startup companies to raise fund. Of course, they would know other people who are rich and are willing to put money in to bet on the new company. The venture, capitali venture capitalist would establish a venture capital company 
where the startup people could go to get fund and they would also provide some help in uh, teaching them how to manage a company, how to do this and that, that things. Uh, so they would have people called angels. Angels are people hired by venture capitalists or they establish venture capital venture capital companies, they would provide startup companies with fund and the management skills. So that's very valuable. And by definition, startup companies are small. They start with a good idea and they want to have a company from very small, usually in their parents' garage. And then they would build it bigger and bigger and bigger. And when they're really, really big and smart and the famous people would want to buy their stock, then what would happen next to them? They would go to a stock market and offer an initial uh, IPO. IPO, let me see, what does that mean? Uh, IPO, initial public offering, okay. That is a, a startup private company would go to the stock market and offer shares to sell on the market. So, so these people, once they sold their shares, they're no longer a privately held company. And that will be a company that's held by the public. So they have to answer to these uh, investors and the government swoop in with lots of laws to for them to follow so that the government can make sure that people don't just uh, swindle a lot of more money and uh, escape and uh, embezzle the, the fund and go away. So there are a lot of laws that the SEC would uh, go after them to enforce these laws to make sure they are so many companies, uh, when they started privately, they hesitate. They did not want to go public. Of course, when they do go public, they can make a lot of money, a lot and lot of money. But uh, uh, sometimes they would rather keep them, keep their company private, huh? so that they could do things that a public uh, company cannot do. They don't have to publish uh, their income and uh, lots of things they, they could keep private because they did not uh, have to meet those uh, SEC. Let me see what SEC is. Security and the Exchange Commission. Okay. The federal government has a commission. So you got uh, it's not really a cabinet uh, position to be a commissioner there, but the, it, it's, it's like in our central government in Taiwan, we would have a Xing Zheng Yuan, which is the executive branch with lots of cabinet, cabinet uh, departments. So you would have a transportation department or education department, all sorts of things, foreign affairs and uh, uh, things like that. But there are smaller entities that belong to the central government. Those are called commissions in, in the United States. In Taiwan, it would be like or things like that. It's not a full-fledged uh, department of the executive branch, but it is a commission, a smaller one. Huh? So, so here we have SEC, which is a commission. Huh? Uh, SEC, and there are many other commissions. Uh, if you want, I can look into it and give you a full list of such things. However, here we're talking about a privately held company and it grew so big so that it's valued at over one billion dollars, but it's still privately held because they they treasure their freedom and their privacy, and they did not want outside money to get 
into the, their company and interfere with their decisions. So these companies are rare. That's why they are called the unicorn companies. And there's a, a person who invented this name, who coined the name. Huh? They say coined the name. That is, you decided to create a new word or to use an existing word for a totally new meaning. So that, that's the word, the verb is called coin. Coin the name by calling privately held startup companies valued at over $1 billion a unicorn company. Uh, that means it is so rare and precious uh, and very successful. So that's called a unicorn. And of course, uh, this word appeared in the article that I recommend it for you to read. And uh, because a unicorn company is defined to have a value over $1 billion, once this word was created, there are later more words created the court, uh, by using this word. There is decacorn, which means a unicorn company valued at more than $10 billion, or a hectocorn, which is a unicorn company valued at more than $1 billion. Here we have the prefix DECA that we talked about quite often in the past few weeks. DECA is the prefix, which means 10. So you have the word decade, which has DECA in the front plus DE to mean 10 years. And the hectare is a uh, hundred. So we would call a uh, hundred acre hectare. Well, a hundred acre in the met metric system is 100 acres, 100 uh, metrical acres, okay. So, so these uh, prefixes were added to the word corn, which is short for unicorn, to indicate a unicorn company having larger value than $1 billion. Uh, according to, of course, everything is according to Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, there are over 450 unicorns as of last October. So in the whole world, there were only 450 such unicorn companies in the whole world. Wow. And a few examples would be Byte Dance, which is called the Dong, and the Didi, which is called the Didi Kuai Di. That is some kind of a, a expedited delivery. Uh, it was a taxi company to begin with. And these are both Chinese company. And uh, in America, we've heard of SpaceX, which is owned by uh, Elon Musk, who, uh, who produces uh, te Tesla cars. Tesla cars is a very prestigious brand of cars. They are at the they are pioneering in electric cars. Uh, and that's on the stock market, but SpaceX is not. So Elon Musk, he created this space company, which has been launching rockets into the space. They want to take private citizens to the moon or to the Mars and so on. He's doing all these space projects on his own private money. He is currently uh, the richest man in the world, beating Amazon's uh, Steve Bezos. And the last one is Airbnb. Uh, many of you probably uh, tried using this one before. It is an online company that helps you to book uh, vacation homes for for your vacation. You can book uh, a rental house or an apartment through them uh, for a reasonable price. And I've personally used it many times. Uh, their trick is to charge you a booking fee and a cleaning fee 
which you would not come across when you book at uh, the hotel room, for example. Uh, and in the past, uh, there are many vacation home uh, rental uh, sites on internet, and they did not charge booking fees. And the summer did not charge cleaning fee, but ever, ever since Airbnb became so popular, uh, they all started to charge something. So it's getting expensive, even though the, the rental itself is not so much. It's, it could still be a good deal, but uh, just try to watch out your cost is not what it says up front. And Lyft is the most recent decacorn that turned into a public company uh, last year. Of course, there could be more new ones, but this was uh, according to the record I could find. And Lyft is similar to uh, Uber, which is a, a taxi company that's, that gets to be very, very popular. Uh, there are two reasons for their getting popular. One. Uh, both both are because they're cheaper than regular taxi because first they avoid the laws that require people going to the i mean they require taxis going to and from the airport to be to buy certain license so that license itself could mean a lot of money that's why that's one of the reasons why a taxi from the airport is so expensive. But Uber and the Lyft, they went up behind the government and they did something so that they don't have to do that. So that, that, that's why they're cheaper. And the other thing cheaper is because they're totally online and uh, they hire people who are regular people who have regular jobs or who have no jobs and they just stay in their car or on the on their phone or at home and whenever there is a call coming in they would take the call and go there to pick you up to pick the customer up that's why they're they're cheaper because uh, they, they don't have regular employees okay uh, the next word is called the flexitarian. It is a combo word. A combination word is called portmanteau. That means parts of two words squeezed together to become one word. Huh. So this word is from flexible and vegetarian. That means a person who is not a strictly vegetarian, which means don't eat meat but there are different levels of vegetarians as well. But a flexitarian means he could actually eat some meat sometimes. So if you're not a strict vegetarian, you can call yourself a flexitarian. So it's a semi or semi-vegetarian diet is a flexitarian diet. It is basically centered on plant food. So you only eat veg vegetables, but you can occasionally eat some meat. It's no big thing to do that. You are flexible. Okay. Uh, there are different levels of vegetarians. When we came from Taiwan or China, we knew vegetarian means you don't eat any meat. However, there are numerous, numerous vegetarians in the Western countries that they call themselves vegetarians, but they eat, they eat eggs or milk or cheese. These are things that you don't really kill an animal and you would get animal protein out of it. So they, they, you can be called the Naisu, uh, which means you are a vegetarian, but you would eat dairy product. Uh, on the other hand, that that's more strict. You would call yourself a vegan. That is a much more strict vegetarian 
uh, and I did know someone who's like that, she would not eat anything that's cooked above 150 Fahrenheit degrees. So it's called uh, probably shen su or something like that. So there are different degrees of vegetarian because there's no law about uh, your diet. You are your own boss. So you decide what kind of vegetarian you are or not. So a lot of new words came out of it, such as demi-vegetarianism. Uh, demi is half. So if you say a, a, a small cup of coffee, half coffee and half milk in French, it would be a demi tasse And reduced terrianism means uh, you, you want to reduce your whatever a footprint so you carb footprint or whatever you're trying to reduce and you call yourself a reducetarian reducetarian okay and the last word that came out of that article is cultured meat if you haven't heard of it and this is something really really new to you but i've heard about it probably 30 or 40 years ago, but that technology has not uh, developed well over the years until recently. This is a way to produce meat, not by raising animals, but not per se, not by raising the, the real animal, but by raising the cells of the animal. They would collect some cells from some animal and put it in vitro. Uh, in vitro is in the test tube. So you don't take that, cell. you don't sell the meat from a real animal. You take the cell from the animal and put it in the test tube and you make it grow and grow and grow. So all you see is a cell of the meat, but not the animal. Uh, in the same theory, you can do the thing by doing uh, vegetables or fruits. When I first heard about, they were doing it with oranges and strawberries. Uh, they would uh, take a strawberry plant and uh, put in the blender and sm smashed into uh, cells, very, very tiny bits. And then they tried to put it in nourishment and let it grow. So you could eat large chunks of uh, strawberry fruits, but never the whole thing. You don't see the stem on top. You only see the, the meat of the fruit, the fresh fruit out of fresh cells of the fruit or vegetable nature, but you don't really see that thing itself. And for meat, if, of course, you would have, uh, for example, beef, you take some beef and you let it grow into a big tub of meat, but it's, you can probably use it as ground meat, but not a steak as it does not go into that stretchy uh, shape of a, of a steak. Uh, so it's a really a, a new concept. It's a, a cellular agriculture. Here we have the word cellular, which is on the a cellular base. It's cell is a huh? So you grow vegetable, meat, or fruits, or whatever from a cell, not from an egg or whatever it is. So this is a, really a newer concept, and it's being being developed better and better nowadays to the stage that you can actually uh, eat or go to a restaurant for it. Uh, the latest one was a, a restaurant uh, that sells hamburger. So the meat would be meat from cell production instead of from the real cows. And uh, this restaurant is in Israel. Uh, they, they just want to try out whether the taste is good enough or with the, the reaction of the consumer. And where did they get this uh, technology? It was uh, from uh, regeneration. 
of uh, yeah, the that is when, when when someone needs a transplant of a new heart, a new kidney, a new lung, and uh, the market is, is very short of this available live organs from recently deceased people, usually from car accident. So you have a long line of people, patients waiting for an available organ. And they decided maybe we could just raise such organs ourselves without getting it from a dead person. So as there's one, one way they would try to transplant a pig organ pig heart or something because they are quite close to human. But if they could do some kind of 3D printing and make lots of organs available to function in a person, that would be much better than waiting for a dead person. So this kind of technology is very promising in the medical profession, but then people started to do it for uh, for food. Uh, so this is a person called Mark Post. He's a professor at Maastricht University. Hmm, okay, I think it's probably pronounced as Maastricht because I was there and the people told me you should pronounce it as Maastricht. Anyway, it's an old, uh, beautiful town in uh, the Netherlands. Yeah, it's in the Netherlands, all right. So this professor, he first did a TED talk about how he could produce the burger patty based on this technology. So this is the, the thing is coming. Yeah, pretty soon you will be able to eat a burger made from the meat of cultured meat. And there's a restaurant in Tel Aviv, which is the capital of Israel, uh, they already open in and the sell, they're selling chicken burger with super meat that is made uh, from the cells. And uh, last year in December, there's a restaurant in Singapore that started to to sell cultured meat by made by a United States firm company called Eat Just. So these are all very, very breakthrough technology and eye popping. This is a new thing. If you haven't heard of it, this is something to talk about on the dinner table tonight. And uh, when, you when you do get meat from the cells of animals, it raised a lot of questions ethical questions, environmental questions, cultural, economic, health, and lots of different questions you have to consider uh, that I'm not going to go into now. Okay, let's go back to our vocabulary. Uh, the first word is diverse, which means uh, having a variation of different kinds of things. And uh, if you make that adjective into a noun, it's called diversity. And it's a very trendy thing to do nowadays because uh, people all have uh, different ideas and they did not like people who have different look or different thinking than themselves. And in order to have a very tolerant society where people can get along, the companies and the government, they all try to teach their employees diversity training. It's called the diversity training. Yeah, I've taken quite a few of those trainings, probably once a year for many years. And that is a teacher would tell you that everyone else has a right to exist just like you. They were born differently from you. They have different skin colors or sexual orientation or gender or whatever. It was not anybody's fault. You did not like that just because you are not one of them. So you have to consider 
that the world is meant for all kinds of people. That's what the diversity training is all about. And the, those people who storm the Capitol building are to go take a diversity training course. Uh, I mean, on January 6th, what happened at US Capitol. And the next word is pollination. Uh, pollination is a noun and that came from the noun pollen, P-O-L-L-E-N, which means huafen. Uh, uh, you know, a flower would have pollen. I mean, many flowers would have pollen, but some would not. Uh, for example, hmm, fern or, well, some lower class plants, I would say lower class, meaning they were lower on the uh, Darwinian uh, ladder of uh, development on the family tree of all the plants. Those uh, uh, more primitive plants would not have pollen, but many uh, developed well plants would have pollen. And when they have pollen, the pollen would be on their flowers in the, mm, next time I should talk to you about the structure of a flower, which part is uh, called what and uh, the function and so on. But right now enough is just to mention that pollen means huafen. So you would have a flower and at the end you would see some, uh, powdery stuff. That's why we call it huafen because it's powdery. And the, most of the time a flower needs to have this pollen touching the center of the female part of the flower in order to pollinate it and the, for it to bear fruit. In order to bear fruit, whether it's apple or zucchini, cucumber, a watermelon, all, all kinds of uh, agricultural product, they need to have a bee to come around and pollinate it. When the bee comes around, it would uh, uh, zip around the flower, the uh, center part of the flower, and they would uh, touch the pollen, and then they would uh, touch the female part of this flower. So that's how pollination happens. Uh, so. In order to carry out pollination, you need animals such as insects, birds, and bats, which is being full, uh, or sometimes not even an animal. You can rely on water or wind or rain, or even the plant themselves. They could pollinate themselves. When the flower is not open itself, the, the pollen inside could pollinate it and the bear fruit, causing it to bear fruit. So these are the different ways uh, for pollination to happen. Uh, here is another thing which is not a bird, uh, not a bee. Huh? We have bees and the bumblebees and the other insects, but we have birds like this one, which is a hummingbird. And that looks like a bottle brush tree flower, but th there are other flowers like this. Yeah, I remember there was a Taiwanese flower. I forgot its name. Anyway, uh, when pollination occurs between species, so one plant and another plant, they're not the same thing. For example, a uh, pumpkin and a zucchini, they're different, but sometimes the bee didn't know it went to this one and then went to another one and it just hope happens that the the species are close enough for them to create an offspring so this offspring is called hybrid hybrid ah, here's the word hybrid which is a, a, a breeding that occurs between two breeds uh, how do you call that in Chinese? Uh, I, I might have known, but I could not come up with a word, but I can. Uh, exactly. It's 
uh, use a derogatory word meaning ah oh, that's a zhajong, uh, it's a bad thing. But uh, when you say it's a hybrid, oh, it's very good, a <laughs> good thing when you call something hybrid in English. That's a good thing. But uh, when you call it in Chinese, it's zhajong. Yeah, I remember when I was still a kid, I went to Taipei Bowl to see a Nongzhai agricultural exhibition exhibit and they had za jiao yu mi and the za jiao uh, sweet potato that was new concept to me i think i was probably 12 years old yeah that's Hun xue. Hun xue. <laughs> yeah it is Hun xue, except that xue is usually used to describe human being human. so we will mm. see uh, many of you have uh, grandchildren who, who are hybrid <laughs> yeah, including my own. <laughs> it's, it's a very common thing nowadays. Uh, it, isn't it? Isn't it a yeah. car model? It's also a, a hybrid. Uh, that, that's because when a car is a gas a and electric car, then you cannot totally rely on it. So it's gas and the electric. So you have a hybrid car. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is a kind of car, but that's not what we usually think of when we say hybrid. Uh, in the beginning, it was people, then it became uh, like, uh, well, actually before it became uh, our new and improved uh, vegetable or fruits, a hybrid would be like law, for example, uh, Magen, do you have a horse and a donkey would the hybrid and uh, bear a child that is a, a mule, M-U-L-E, okay? So th that's a hybrid. Uh, all sorts of things could happen when you have a hybrid. For example, mules cannot have baby mules. They could not breed with another mule and uh, uh, birth another mule. So every time you want a mule, you have to get a horse and a donkey and the breed them. Uh, have you seen a horse, a regular horse, and a zebra, banma, and their hybrid would be a horse with some stripes, but not all of the stripes. So that would be a hybrid. But uh, that that could happen in nature. Uh, but now people are doing it big time. They do a lot of hybrid. They're just trying to hit the jackpot by doing all kinds of manipulation in order for them to find the perfect something. Uh, the next bullet says the most essential stable food crops on the planet, like rice, wheat, maize, soybean, sorghum, sorghum, huh? sorghum is uh, gaoliang, huh? otherwise we pretty much know what they are. Maize is the uh, American word for corn. Uh, corn was originally from the Nambe uh, just the Americas. Uh, it was called the maize. Then they, after Christopher Columbus, it was brought to the, the West Western Europe. And sorghum uh, in Taiwan, we know that Jinmen. Uh, produces a lot of uh, sorghum because uh, their soil is not fertile enough to plant rice or wheat. So, so they produce sorghum, which is a less less demanding uh, crop to raise. And uh, they produce gaoliangjiu, which is a distilled uh, uh, spirit. How do you say spirit? Zhengliujiu, uh, huh? Uh, made of sorghum. Uh, uh, this bullet tells you about all the food, stable food crops. The most common food that people plant in large quantity, they do not require uh, bees to pollinate. They rely on wood most of the time. So you just plant lots of them and they will pollinate by themselves because of the wind blowing through them. Uh, when I was a kid, maybe 15, once I planted some corns in my garden and what I got was like uh, baby corns with only one or two or 10 grains 
of corn. In, in, inside this ear of corn, you have only a few because I only planted a few plants, like two or three or four. And you need to have like four by four, six plants in order for the cr cross pollination to happen. So if you're going to plant some corn next year, make sure you plant more than one plant. You need a lot of them, the more the merrier. So if, uh, if you're a farmer, you don't have to worry because you're planting acres and acres of corn or wheat or rice or maize or soybean or sorghum. And you never have to worry about not having enough bees. However, if you plant zucchinis, tomatoes, or whatever, just about every other food crop that's not staple. Huh? Staple means that you're very basic food. So it usually means your carb, carbohydrate came from the food, which is rice and wheat and so on. The non-staple food would be vegetables and fruits. Uh, fruits could all often come from a tree, but uh, in the field, in the farm, you would plant an annual plants and they would bear fruits such as watermelon or zucchini or whatever, and they require, they require pollination. So the bee, uh, colonies kept dying off, you are in trouble, uh, which is happening in all over, all over the world. Uh, in the United States, uh, bee colony collapsing has happened for quite a few years. Uh, you have to pay high price to rent the <clears throat> Apiary, let me see. I don't, I'm not sure I can spell it. Apiary. Apiary is, uh, we say, orchard. If you raise a lot of bees, then this place where you raise a lot of bees is called apiary. I hope that's right. Apiary. Yeah. Another word close to it is. Uh, tented the huge room for birds. It's very similar to it. Uh, could anybody? Anyway, I'm just talking about people who raise bees as a living. They would have lots of beehives. Huh? Beehives. And usually nowadays you would raise your bee in a box, a square box, and you stack them up so you can have lots of them and you can move them around. And if you are a farmer planting a vegetable or fruit that needs pollination, you could go out to somebody who raised bees and you would rent their beehives. When the flowers are blooming in your farm, you would put the hives next to it. So every day the bees would come out and do their job. And as what they did resulted in honey and wax, your, your farm would be okay for bearing fruit and so on. So that's uh, one thing. Okay, that's about pollination. Uh, loss of pollinator is that you do not have enough uh, pollinators such as bees, uh, usually uh, because of disease. Uh, recently, there's a kind of virus in bees, just like our coronavirus, that's killing lots of bees, and the bee colonies are collapsing. That made uh, the farmers very worried. And the price of honey would keep going up and up. Nowadays, uh, you, you have to pay a pretty penny to buy really good honey because uh, honey is so expensive that they're mixing it with sugar uh, or they're feeding their bees with sugar so they could produce a lot more honey. And that would cause your, the quality of honey to go down. Uh, these are the reasons for the uh, pollinator decline, including habitat destruction, 
that is a the ecosystem where the the bees would thrive are disappearing. Pesticides, parasitism would be a qi sheng chong ha, some kind of parasite in the bees that would kill the bees. Disease and the climate change. Yeah, climate change is the disturbing everything in the ecosystem right now. So uh, I want to talk a little more about ecosystem, which we talked about last time quite extensively. This word is called the habitat. Habitat is similar to this ecosystem, but uh, is uh, a smaller thing. An ecosystem can have different habitats for different uh, animals or plants. Uh, for example, I, we had a similar picture about uh, an ecosystem, but if you are talking about a certain animal or fish or coral or plant in this ecosystem, this, this part of the world is the habitat for that particular plant or animal. This is how you use the word habitat. It is some environment concerning a certain or a few that, uh, plants or animals instead of ecosystem, which is a much bigger thing that uh, contains a lot of different animals and uh, different uh, uh, plants. Uh, here is a habitat for penguins. So you look at this and you know where this animal thrives very cold weather with ice everywhere and they could thrive and uh, if it's too hot they could not thrive that is a funny thing there are quite a few penguin varieties in the world but uh, maybe you do not know that they only appear in the southern hemisphere so they're in antarctica all the time all the places but one of them would go as far as Galapagos, which is right on the equator because it was born that way. But above equator, above the equator, you do not see penguins unless you're in the zoo. Uh, if you go to uh, the North Pole, you would think, oh, that's a perfect habitat for penguins. But no, you would not be able to find a penguin in North Pole because they don't live there. Uh, that's not because the environment is not good for them. They could probably live very well there, but no one bothered to take one of them up for thousands of miles to a different place. So they were not able to go there. And this is another habitat. It is for some kind of mountain goat, maybe called an ibex. I-B-E-X or something like that. Yeah, once me and my sister, we went to a, a museum in San Rafael in Utah and they had 250 kinds of goat, of different kinds from all the world, all over the world. That's how many different kinds of mountain goat you have. And I could not tell what kind this is, but if you ever go to Denali, uh, National Park in Alaska, uh, the tour guide would tell you to just look high above where the tree stops growing. That's where you can find the, the mountain goats there. I think their mountain goats is called the Dar, Dal, Dal sheep. Yeah, they're called the Dal sheep, D-A-H-L. That, that's kind of mountain goat in Denali in Alaska. But of course, we have lots of mountain goat in uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, there's so many of them that we had to airlift them to somewhere else. So they live in this very harsh area right between the tree line, uh, right on the tree line. Uh, we say tree line, but in Chinese, we would say xue xian, which is snow line. That is the line uh, on the map above which uh, 
it's all snow and the below which uh, trees could grow. So above that line, you don't see any snows. So that's a, a harsh habitat for mountain goat, but that's the habitat for this kind of animal. And this is another habitat. I don't know what it's for, but it's in the rainforest with lots of uh, big trees and uh, uh, plants with air roots. They grow on the trunk of other plants. So they have aerial roots. Uh, your, uh, aerial roots. Okay, yeah. In Chinese, we could call them having chicken. Uh, like um, orchid, uh, we here in this area, when we plant orchid, uh, if you could make it grow year after year, blooming well, then you are uh, excellent. You have you have green thumb. However, if you live in the hot and humid area, you could just tie it around the tree trunk and it will grow beautifully. I've been to fancy hotel with this orchids blooming all around the trees. Some are palm trees, some are not. But that's the habitat for some kind of animals and uh, plants like this. And there are uh, other different kinds like this. This is a wetland. Wetland is very important to our ecosystem. Lots of uh, plants and animals uh, use uh, this air, this kind of uh, habitat to live. And it absorbed a lot of uh, storm water, whether the water is coming out of the land or from the ocean, this uh, lots of water would flood the, this, uh, the flat land, this uh, 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 wetland. Uh, so by preserving the wetland, you can preserve the earth in good shape. And that's why people now realize that wetland is not to be reclaimed for fancy waterfront properties. It is to be protected so that we can let the earth live longer. And uh, this is one of the last habitat I'm showing you that looks like just nothing could grow there. However, it is the habitat for certain plants and the animals, they could thrive in this kind of habitat. Uh, here is a map of biome. The biome is a collection of plants and animals that have common characters in the environment they exist. So we can uh, easily see that there are places that are dry in darker brown color. Some parts in Mexico and the United States and mostly in Northern Africa and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, gee, I don't know where's the boundary between Asia and uh, Africa. I would guess it's right here in the Sinai Peninsula instead of somewhere else. Yeah, okay. So this is Saudi Arabia with all that uh, desert. And here we have Xinjiang and Mongolia, Mon Mongolia. And here a large part of Australia. These are very, very dry. On the other hand, we have uh, very green or light green areas where people love to live because they are e it's easier for them to live by planting agricultural product. Uh, so the, this is a biome is another word for a bigger area than a habitat. It's you can say biome is smaller than ecosystem, but bigger than a habitat. Maybe not. Anyway, there are several kinds of biomes in the world, and a few places I've been to, for example, South Africa, they would say they have five kinds of biomes of the six or seven kinds in the world. So their land is peppered with many different kinds of habitats and different kinds of veg vegetarian, <laughs> veg vegetations 
and animals. Uh, that's one of the outstanding country that has many different biomes. Uh, usually we would have, if, if you have, have a relatively small country, you only have one or two or three of the biomes, but some countries, they do have lots of different biomes. Now we move on to the next word, which is a photosynthesis. That is guang he zuo yong. Photo is uh, guang he. Uh, we have photon, which is guang zi. And uh, the word synthesis is to combine things and make into something different, to create new things out of different things. So we say photosynthesis is guang he. Huh? Well, we, nowadays we wear lo lots of different kinds of uh, uh, fabric uh, as our clothing, but uh, some of them, many or most of them are synthetic fiber. They are made of synthetic fiber, which in Chinese would be hua, hua, hua he qian wei. Okay, so synthesis is hua he, huh? and uh, photo is a uh, light. And what happens when light hits something that is green? And the living, the, that's when photosynthesis uh, happens. You have a tree with leaves that contains chlorophyll, that is a yeru su. Huh? And uh, when the sun shines on the green leaves, uh, something happened, photosynthesis happened. And as a result, it, uh, it uh, absorb the, the leaves would absorb the carbon dioxide, which is uh, with the sunlight and their own chlorophyll, which is uh, so they would create carbon hydrates, which is the magic word for the world to live. In the organic world, the photosynthesis is the fundamental thing that make agriculture happen. So all the plants you grow, you let them sit in the sun and the, they're exposed to carbon hydrate, carbon, <laughs> I'm sorry, carbon dioxide. And they create lots of different carbohydrates such as uh, wheat and rice and tomato, potatoes and watermelon and whatever they create is out of this photosynthesis process. This, it's a, the magic, the greatest the magic and mystery in the world that made everything live. Okay. If you put it down as a formula, uh, six CO2 plus six HO2, that is and water, and you put them in the light, they produce sugar and oxygen. Uh, not only do they pr produce sugar, which is monumentally important to us and to everything else, it also produces oxygen. That's just the greatest thing that we could hope for out of a plant. Now, here's another map. This map shows you the global distribution of photosynthesis. And uh, the explanation is on the land, you have the uh, you have the blue green colored area on the land, and you have the dark red area in the ocean that indicates photosynthesis is taking place. So in the ocean, it's kind of hard. You're not really letting the sun shining on the kelp a lot. There are quite a few kelp. Hai dai, ha, K -E -L -P, that grow in the ocean. But uh, there are only a very few spots where photosynthesis is, is really growing. Uh, these could be next to a, a waterway. Huh? And over here, there are a few red places. And on the land, you have all these green areas that are uh, filled with trees and uh, other plants. So this map would show you where agriculture is thriving. It's just like the other map 
showing all the places with the harsh uh, habitat. And what they create, the plants create, it becomes nutrient for the animals when they eat the plants. For example, rice or wheat, they feed the people or they feed the horses and cows and they become, they serve as a nutrient for the animals. Uh, this word dynamic is very interesting and a good word. We say something is dynamic, we mean it's very lively and moving and changing and active. Uh, or we say a person or animal is very active or powerful, energetic. All these good things can be used to describe by, by using, <laughs> can, be a, you, can be used as dynamic when you use the word dynamic, okay? Uh, so, okay. Uh, when we talk about this uh, habitat, it could experience periodic disturbances. And it would be translated into zhou qi xing, the saura. So there's some kind of disturbances going on and it comes and goes and comes and goes. Not necessarily so periodic. When we uh, see the word zhou qi xing, we thought, oh, it's once a week or once a month or once every 30 years. No, it's not that regularly periodic. It could be an earthquake or a volcanic eruption that comes to an area periodically, but never on the schedule. So it can, you can use the word periodic as meaning it comes now and then, but not on the regular basis. And this saurau is a kind of <laughs> this uh, not good word. It means disturbances. Disturb is the verb. Uh, last time we talked about, about this uh, keystone, and so I'm not going to talk uh, too much about it, but it says the keystone is usually in the wedge shape. So it's got that part uh, in the red color to let you see that this clearly is a capstone or a keystone in this archway, which was invented 6,000 years ago by the Sumerians, but the, uh, the Roman architecture uh, really improved on it a lot so that they could build beautiful and durable uh, gates or arches uh, for millennia, thousands and thousands of years. That's, that's an archway with a, a wedge on top as a keystone. And uh, I last time I also showed you a picture of what I took in Mycenae, but actually we went to a different place in Mycenae, which is called the tomb of uh, Clytemnestra. Well, this is so-called a tomb of this person, which is definitely not her tomb. We could tell definitely it's not her tomb, even if we call it tomb of Clytemnestra. And Clytemnestra is the wife of Agamemnon, uh, who was the hero in the, Tro, 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 the war of Troy. Uh, Agamemnon led the victorious, triumphant army of the Greek states and he won that war and he came home and was killed in the bathtub by his wife, Clytemnestra. Okay, so if you want to know something about Troy, about Homer, or about Greek tragedies, you would come across the name Agamemnon in no time, okay? You would probably see King Oedipus or pronounced as Oedipus, Oedipus, Oedipus or Oedipus and Agamemnon are the two most famous people in the Homerian epic or in the 
uh, Greek mythology or in the Greek tragedy. Uh, someday I would uh, talk about in more detail, but it is co so complicated because it's been for thousands of years and every artist would like to change it a little bit. So you can never say this thing happened to this guy and so on and so forth, you, because along came somebody 500 years later who, who would change the story totally. So nobody could get it, straighten it out. So that's a very complicated uh, topic but it's very, very popular in the Western culture. So we do need to get some kind of exposure to the Greek myth and the Greek tragedies. And I was talking about this tomb, which could be a tomb. And at the end of this way, which is uh, going downward, you would go into this place which is a, a, like a cave. And the way you were going in there, you would pass through this gate, which is in the next picture. At the bottom, there is a gate with the big rock, tons or hundreds of tons. I think I got it like a hundred tons or something. This big rock on top of this gateway where you walk through underneath, that is short of a keystone the, the, the thing that's holding everything together. Uh, that's because this is very old and uh, there was no arch or keystone at that time. Uh, this uh, story probably happened between, uh, I don't know, 800 years BC or something like that. All those things happened or were told about uh, because it's not facts, not history. So you don't know the, the exact dates. Okay. So you see this doorway where you walk through and this big stone on top because there was no arch and no capstone, no keystone. Well, we, I use the word capstone and keystone interchangeably because they, they, are, they are both talking about this kind of stone in this picture, okay? So short of an archway, you would either have a big rock on, on top of the gate or like the one on top, you would arrange these rocks ever closer and closer until they reach a point where you can put a bigger rock on top to keep them all in place. So all these rocks underneath were kept actually stable, stabilized by this, big rock on top. That is a short of a wedge shaped uh, uh, keystone. You can build a, a, some sort of a gateway by stacking these rocks. So when you construct this, it's not exactly all about what is underneath. It is what would come at the end on top because this one on top keeps everything together. Uh -huh. And uh, another town we went to is Olympia in Greece. Uh, we were in Mycenae in the previous two pictures. And this is a, a, real, a real archway where each stone is wedge shaped. Uh, so it's one side bigger and one side smaller. And when you put them all together and you try your best to hold them together and put in the last one on top, then you can let go because it'll never fall down. Okay, that's in Olympia where they had the Olympic games like 800 years before Christ. But when you talk about a wedge, it's actually a, a wedge shaped thing with a pointed end. Uh, this you would uh, use it to split the wood. If you have a tree, a big tree that was cut into sections and you want to use this sections of wood you cannot possibly put that in your fireplace. So you would use a wedge to split it open. You put this on top of the cut edge of the lock and you hit it somewhat so it stays there. Then you use a big hammer to hit the top of it and it would go like in the picture on the right, it would go into the log and split it open. 
that is one of the ingenious tools that man, human, invented. If you go to a place with lots of Indian relics, and if you go to a souvenir shop, you could possibly find some of the rocks cut into the wedge-shaped thing, so they could use it on the arrow to shoot the animal when hunting, or uh, you, they can use it as a tool to do other things like uh, uh, grinding food and things like that. That's why uh, there was a Yuan Shi Shi Dai, we have monolithic uh, era uh, or lithographic. No, we're talking about pictures. We're talking about the tool, about the tools. The, the tools could be Shi Qi Shi Dai or Tie Qi Shi Dai. A human, no matter where you go, you would see people using pieces of rocks first and then they started to have bronze and they start to have iron whoever has iron could make bet much better weapon than others so they would conquer other tribes so these are all the ancient tools and the wedge is one of them uh, when we talk about this keystone it is at the apex of this archway and apex apex okay apex could mean the top of uh, a polyhedron uh, three-dimensional on top of uh, uh, a polygon huh? a polygon is a, a shape in with many sides and then if you build it up then it becomes a three-dimensional polyhedron. And on the top, there's one place that's higher than any other place on this thing. That's called the apex. So it's uh, the top of a polyhedron, or it can be the top of a triangle of an isosceles. So you have a triangle which has two equal sides. This means this side is the same length of this side as this side. And this angle is the same angle as this one. And that's is called the ISO, which means equal. Uh, ISO, isosceles is a triangle with two equal sides. And by definition, they would also have two angles at the bottom that are equal. So the top of both this and that are called the apex. And this word is peripheral. When we first had, had a computer, we would say, here is your CPU, and these are the peripherals of this computer. So the computer is a part that has a motherboard and that gives the instruction uh, to how, how to operate and so on. And you have all these peripherals, which are, uh, like in the last line, the keyboard, the mouse, the sound system, the printer, all these devices that are used around, uh, to make it work for the computer to work, but they do not have the central processing unit. Uh, the central processing unit or CPU is the soul, the central part of the computer, while all the other things are called the peripherals. So the word peripheral could mean uh, on the boundary, not in the capital. On the periphery, which is uh, all over this on the side. Huh? Or number two is beside the point. It's not the thing that you should be talking about. You should be talking about. Uh, so if you talk about this thing that is peripheral, you are, you're beside the point. Okay. And the uh, Peripheral also means unimportant because the central part is the most important part. And it's the auxiliary, which means a fu shu. So all these means peripheral. And this is a, a very common word, and I wish you would remember this. Uh, we say it's a 
your tan xing, which means it's elastic, you can stretch it and it will go back and things like that. However, most often in our life, we would use this word to describe a person, even though he experienced uh, destructive uh, happenings or emotional abuse or whatever happened to this person, he could uh, or she could rebound. Uh, it's like go push you, push this person down. But once the, the bad thing left, this person would flourish and becomes a whole and good and happy again. So we say this person is resilient. Uh, so even though we say you xing, uh, it's not about a person, it's about a thing. But we use this word very often about a person. Sometimes we, we would say this, the children are resilient because they could uh, encounter lots of abuse from bad things, but they would emerge happily and have a normal life. That's what it means to be resilient. Okay. Organism is a, a thing that is organic. So just huh? And the pseudoscience is when we talk about astrology. Uh, even though astrology just uh, you don't this kind of theory or science was developed for hundreds of thousands of years and the people uh, collected the information and the knowledge about the thing for so long but once science appeared and it's all exposed as a pseudoscience so astrology which was considered a science for millennials. It is actually a pseudoscience, which is fake news, fake, fake science. So it's used in many ways like pseudo archeology, span pseudo history, pseudo linguistics, pseudo mathematics, pseudo philosophy, pseudo science, pseudo culture. The, the pseudo is a prefix put in front of some elegant uh, thoughts and make it into a false word, a word about a false uh, discipline. And uh, the last time I talked about uh, 12 signs of the zodiac, uh, for their astrology to work, they need to chart the stars uh, using horoscope and they, I mean, the Western people, they would divide the sky that the earth circle around the sun. There's just, here's the sun and here's the earth circle and they are sitting on a plane. Uh, they usually do not go up or down. They're on the plane and the we people divided this plane into 12 sections. And because of the sun rotates around and around, this would mean approximately the 12th month where the earth moved from one place to another. Usually we start with Aries, which is between March and April. Uh, here we have the dates for those uh, uh, zodiac sign. Uh, if you were born within this period of time, you were born under the sign of Aries, like me. I was born under the sign of Aries, but I know nothing about it because early on I knew it's fake news. I never believed in anything about your fortune telling. So I don't know much about Bai Yang Gong. Huh? And if you start with this, it's probably because of a uh, uh, spring equinox, uh, Chun. Chunfen, huh? on this day it's Chunfen, uh, which is either spring equinox or vernal equinox because spring is when everything starts to grow green leaves. Uh, vernal means, uh, let me put it here, vernal. you will see it later today. Vernal means uh, green. Huh? So we have Bai Yang Gong and then 
you have Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, uh, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and the Pisces. Uh, we would pronounce it the way I just say it. However, these are all from Latin, so you don't really pronounce it that way. It's wrong, but that's how we do it. Uh, for example, Leo is a lion. Uh, the word is similar to lion, and sometimes we say Leo, Leon, L-E-O-N. Some people in some country uh, would say Leon uh, as lion. And Cancer is a crab, a giant crab. Gemini is a twins and all these things. If you are interested, you can go in and go online to look for which sign you're under. Uh, we would say you are under the sign. You were born under the sign of certain things, for example, Sagittarius. But some of the animals are not real animals like Sagittarius. It's, we call it Jemagum. So it's a man uh, with a man's head, but the horse body. But some are real, like a Leon or uh, Taurus or Aries, these are real animals. Uh, Pisces uh, is usually a pair of fish. Okay, and these are their symbols. Each one is represented by a symbol. A millennial is a word that we came across when we got into the year 2000, when the computer was such a scare that we, we, we were scared that the entire system all over the world would crash, but nothing happened. Uh, so we learned the word millennium, which means 1,000 years. And some people, young people born during those years were called the millennials. And I got this chart. I was very excited to learn about. We've heard about generations for years and years. And here is a chart that sums it all. Here we have the light green colored lost generation. They were born, the first of them were born in 1883. And uh, they lasted uh, until 1970. Wow. Some of the long, longer living people in that generation would experience all these things in their lifetime. And the generation after that is a silent generation or it's called the lucky few. But uh, we are probably the baby boomers or the one, some, some of us were born uh, as a lucky few, but many of us are baby boomers and it's called the me generation because this generation is so arrogant that everything is about me. That's why it's called the me generation. Uh, the people in this generation would be born uh, from 1946 on. So I, I am one of them. And uh, if they were born in 1964, that's the end of the generation. And you would jump into the next one, which is called the Generation X. And the next one is the Millennials. It's also called Generation Y. And the next one is called Zoomers. I've never heard of Zoomers. And uh, now they are the people who are on Zoom all the time. Generation Z and the current generation people are born since uh, 2010. It's called the Generation Alpha. I have not heard of them either. So these are the generations and they pretty much have a common trace for all these people in this generation because they were born in a similar time, in a similar situation so there this is a western world so our chinese would be totally different from these when i came from taiwan to america i would feel that i am behind them by 10 or 20 or 30 years because things that happened to them did not happen to us yet uh, but of course nowadays that gap is getting shorter and shorter Okay, that's another chart you can go back to review. So if you want to find anything, you, there are many uh, uh, about something that I talked about. You could either push the print screen 
or you can go on YouTube to watch this and you know where I'm approximately at. You find that slide and you pause it, then you can take a screenshot of it. Or you can go just by looking at the title, for example, Generations of the Western World and Google it and find something. And more likely you will find these things in Wikipedia. So you can really uh, study it for a long time with all the information available. And this is about the dye and the soluble because we were talking about pigment. We were talking about the three primary colors and that you can make things into different colors by either dye or pigment. Uh, dye is a soluble uh, most of the time from the plant. Uh, you can dye a thing into the color you like. And you can also add something which is a chemical bind so that the color will stay on your clothing, for example. So that would be improving the fastness of the dye. Fast means, when we say color fast, it means that's called fast. Huh? Usually we say fast, meaning you run very fast or something happened very quickly. But when you say fast about the fabric, the dye on the fabric, that means whether it would stick there longer or not. And the plant dye would uh, usually come in the form of a solution, which is uh, dissolved in water while some uh, pigments from uh, mine, uh, something from the mine like Hong uh, Shito, Hei Shito, Lan Shito, such as uh, uh, turquoise or uh, ochre, uh, like soil or something. You dye something not with a dye, but with pigment. That's, that's how you can use minerals to change the color of things or do painting. Uh, the way things appear in different color is because they absorb the light certain part of the wavelength and leaving the rest of it not being absorbed. So if something absorbed, say red and yellow, but that does not absorb the blue, then you would look at it and you see the blue color. It's not because it is actually blue. It's just because blue color was rejected by that thing. So if you have a white ray of beam, a prism, it comes into a prism, then because of the wavelengths of different waves, like red wave, orange wave, yellow wave, and so on, each of them having a different wavelength and they would change direction. They re would, they would uh, deflect or reflect, uh, not reflect. You see a mirror, the light was reflected from the mirror, but you have a prison and the light goes in there and got bent. It was bent this way and that way. And when it comes out, it becomes a spectrum of lights from red all the way to violet. All these lights are separated because when the white light came into a prism, all these different colors of light were bent in different ways. So that when you look at this side, if you put the white sheet of paper on this side, you will be able to see rainbow color on this paper. And the great scientist who in who discovered it was Isaac Newton. Huh? As uh, uh, this great uh, astrophysicist, uh, what's his name? Tyson. Uh, do you know Tyson's name? Uh, a, a black scientist. Uh, he's the head of the Hayden uh, Observatory or uh, not observatory. It, it's part of the, of the observatory is part of it. It's a New York City Museum of Nat Nat Natural 
science. Yeah, 自然科学博物馆的馆长哈、huh? He his idol is Isaac Newton. He talks about Isaac Newton every day. And、uh, if you like science,、uh, I encourage you to go on YouTube. And he has tons and tons of videos on YouTube talking about all kinds of、uh, astrophysics. Physic titles of videos, and Isaac Newton was、uh, the person who discovered that when you put a white light into a prism, it becomes a spectrum of different colors. That was a great、uh, invention, or <laughs> it's not invention, a discovery. Huh?、Uh, okay, so you could see this, just like a rainbow. You have all these different. Colors, I think a rainbow would have a red at the bottom, and the blue or violet on top. It's always the same order. You will never be able to see a rainbow with colors in different places because it is universal. It is science. It is the same every day,、uh, no matter how you wish something would be different. Science is science. That's why we trust it, and.、Uh, That's why Trump doesn't trust it. <laughs> I just cannot go on one day without mentioning Trump, but now he's gone forever. I hope. Okay, a spectrum is a condition that is not limited to a specific setup. But so, a, when you say a spectrum, it would be a series of things that change from one one end to the other, but not. In blocks, not one block of red, one block of white. No, it is continuous. So we call that a spectrum, which in Chinese we would call a guangpu, huh? Because it's like a musical sheet with all kinds of notes going to different places. I guess a array of different things that is one thing, but in a certain order. And later on, after Newton, we realize that light is not a ray of light; it is a ray of many things that are waves, and these waves are called the electromagnetic waves. They are the 电磁波 and the 电磁波所形成的 spectrum 就是它的光谱啊 Uh, we see lots of things. They are all in these colors, like a rainbow, with six or seven colors. People like the number seven, so in the beginning they decided there are seven colors in the rainbow. But after many years, they decided it's actually six. So now people agree there are six colors, not seven. So we thought everything is in one of these colors, but no. When you put the light in. Into a spectrum, which is electromagnetic spectrum, the the part that we can see is only this bit. This this little part is called visible. If you enlarge it, you have a spectrum of different colors. But these are all the colors that are visible, and all the rest of them are not visible. The the light waves that are Much longer to much shorter, we could not see them, like Wi-Fi, X-ray, infrared, thermal waves, microwaves, radio waves, long waves. All these、um, electromagnetic waves in the spectrum we could not see, but we use them extensively. That's how we use our cell phone, use our radio, use our Medical equipment like、uh, CT scanners and so on. All these things were invented by man, even though they could not see them. Isn't that great? I always say I live in the best time in human life because there's so many great things happening. Ah, the next word is symptom, which is、uh, when you are sick and you are showing some signs and symptoms. And the doctor or some more experienced people will be able to make a judgment and decide what kind of illness you have. 
So this is called zheng zhuang. Huh? It could be signs or symptoms. It could be something that people can see. For example, uh, you're getting skinnier or you're yellowish or, uh, or something they could feel like your pose from your pose. Um, Oh, this is this good my boy, huh? Uh, and something no none of us can see, but we can find out. We can do a blood test that tells a lot about you to a doctor. So that that could be uh, how your blood test shows could uh, be symptoms that the doctor can see and uh, make a judgment on. Huh? So so this is what symptom is. And uh, when the doctor look at you and gives you tests and the, get the test result, then the doctor will be able to decide what point, what uh, problem you have. And that is called the diagnosis. The doctor make a decision about your illness based on the signs and symptoms is called a diagnosis. As a verb, it, it is diagnose. And uh, what were we talking about? The five senses. Uh, we were talking about hallucination and uh, what's the other word? Uh, Delusion. Delusion, yes, okay. We're talking about delusion, which is that your mind just went crazy. You, you could, it seems to you some things are true, but they're not. So you're having a delusion. And if you have a hallucination, then it's not necessarily that your mind went crazy. It's that your five senses went crazy. You would touch something or you would hear something or you will see, see something as if they were real, but they were not real. That's, that's the word to use to describe your situation. You were hallucinating, okay? So, so we, last week we talked about the five ways you could be hallucinating. They are auditory, visual, olfactory, tactile, and gustatory. These are the five senses a person has, and they mean the senses of, on the right-hand side, your hearing, vision, smell, touch, and taste. These are the five senses. Uh, we're, we often come across words with audio, so we know the word audio, which means hearing or listening. And the visual, that's also a common word. You go to the doctor to have a vision test. Uh, so visual is uh, about your vision. But uh, the next three words are less familiar to us, even though the function, the sense, it, they are all very familiar to us. Uh, olfactory is your smell, but this is a fancy word, meaning a smell. Uh, so I got a picture of this, and it is quite amazing how these nerves uh, populate your upper nose and they would feel the smell and tell uh, this nerve would collect all your feeling of smell and pass it on to your brain and then your brain would process these feelings and know what it smells like that's really a miracle I would think yeah and the next word is tactile, which means touch. Huh? Touch is also, also very a common word. And the taste, of course, is a common word. But the gustatory uh, is not a common word. It is about, this is a taste bud. Huh? And the, on your tongue, you have taste buds. That's a way lay. Huh? Uh, it is something like little bumps on your tongue. The small ball like thing, and they each had this feelers sticking out, and they could feel what the taste was whether it's a hot pepper or sweet donut or whatever you were eating. And they would pass this through these nerves to your brain so that your brain would reach, receive this 
signals and decide what it tastes like. So you look at a human being with all these five senses, it's just a marvelous piece of creation that ever existed. Uh, so these are the five senses and what is the sixth sense? You have ever, ever heard of sixth sense? Uh, you probably have, the huh? The sixth sense is you cannot see it, you cannot feel it, you cannot taste it, you cannot uh, smell it, you cannot touch it. You, there's no sense that gives you the feeling that something is there, but you just have this sixth sense, which is in this movie, uh, this uh, kid played by Haley Joel Osman, he could see ghosts. He walked around and he could see ghosts. And the Bruce Willis was trying to help him to get over this feeling. And uh, it turns out in the end, Bruce Willis is a dead person. So this is a real kicker in the plot line that revolutionized the, the world of movie. People started to look for this great surprise at the end of the movie and of the sixth sense this movie gives you the really satisfactory hit and that's why it's it's uh, such a box, box office hit uh, the next one i'm talking about is the mesopotamia uh, we say that the sumerian people was the earliest people who invented the archway with a keystone. And they were the Sumerian, huh? and they came from as Mesopotamia. Here on the map, we can see Mesopotamia, where Meso means middle, and the Potamia means river. So in the middle of two rivers is called Liahe Liu Yu. And here we have Syria, Iraq, and over there, we have uh, Iran or Iran. And over there we have Turkey. And here we have Euphrates, Euphrates, and uh, Tigris. Uh, so these two river in Iraq, in e Iraq or Iraq, they form the Mesopotamia. So here I'm in reminding you of a word called the Mesopotamia, which is the area between the two rivers where very old civilization came. And uh, of course, this part is probably most of the civilization recited. That is the delta of the river. Usually at the end of the river, just when it goes into the sea, it is flat and the very arable, lots of land you can plant things, that's how uh, you, people can be fed. And this is where great old ancient civilization started. And this is Liang He Liu Yu. And just to get you a little taste of what this river is like, it's just like any other like river, but it's so mythical that uh, it lets us want to go there. Okay, so I want to show you, I was once here, probably here, okay? And I was uh, right here taking a ferry boat to cross this river, which is Euphrates, Euphalades. Uh, we came from here, from Lake Van and all the way to the riverside and we took the ferry cross in order to get to the other side, of course. So we would see the river coming out of the source, not too far away, and this is Euphrates. And we were getting onto this ferry boat, which is um, not too big. There are already two cars on there, and our van would drive, squeeze into this space in between those two cars, and we'll be at the head of the river, uh, of the ferry boat. Uh, once we're on this boat, we're there to enjoy the river. This is a down river and that the up, the up, this is the upside of the source of the river and this is down river. It's just like any river, but it's the fable, the Euphrates. And the hotel we stayed that night is called, called the Hotel Euphrates. So it's Yo Paladi Liguan. 
and the city or town is called the Nemrat. Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. And all their guests were there trying to go on top of the Mount Nemrat to see the, one of the greatest attractions around here. And it's located right here in the town of Nemrock, which is so small that you could hardly see it. It's not on the map, okay? And what do you see? You see a lot of huge thrones. They were topped with human heads, like, like the one that's here. That's King Antiochus I. He, his head was on top of one of the thrones and the other heads like those of Apollo, Hercules, or the other Greek gods and eagles and lions, their heads used to be on top there. However, he was 300 years before Christ. And after 2000 or more years, all those heads were chopped deliberately by some people hundreds of years ago. We do not know who chopped their head off. Apparently they did not like this kind of uh, idol worshiping or something. So if you were this king, you thought you were on top of the world and you put your head carved in stone on top of a throne, on top of a very high mountain did you think that one day your head would be chopped off? Of course not. So that's what's happening to those which will never happen to us. Okay, now we're learning the word about Mesopotamia. Here we have Mesoamerica, which, in the, which means Middle America. And uh, it's an older word when uh, soon after Columbus, we call this area um, this map, Mesopotamia, uh, Mesoamerica, which is a part of Mexico, part Belize, part Guatemala. We say Guatemala, but it's actually Guatemala. And we go down, we have uh, Honduras here and the Salvador. So this is the, uh, on this nowadays current map, it's means this area, okay? That's called the Mesoamerica, but we call this Central America. It's all because of politics. These are these countries now, but they were not countries here. So this is called Central America, and this is Central America. And on this map, you have Mesoamerica here, and you have Central America here. They would intersect somewhat here. But do you know that Mexico is part of North America? North America consists of Canada, United States, and Mexico. And Mexico is not part of Central America. Central America would start from Guatemala, Belize, and all the way down to Panama. And when you reach Colombia, that's South America. Uh, so there was a thriving, or not just one, but more than one thriving civilization in this area, which is Central, Af uh, Central America. Uh, what, for 1,000 years be before Columbus was here. So people who are into archeology span would uh, love to go there to see what it was like before Columbus. Uh, or go back to this word about hippopotamus. <laughs> it is part of the word is potamus, which means river as in Mesopotamia. And the word hippo means horse on top of it, uh, a, a prefix. So this word is hippopotamus. Uh, it is what we would call hema. Huh? Hema is a, a river horse, this animal is called the river horse in Chinese. And the word in English or in Latin is hippopotamus. So you have hippo, which is horse. And potamus is river. And this is another word. We're going away and 
away from the original word. This word is called the hippodrome. That is a horse racing stadium. It's called a hippodrome. A drome is a racing, chariot racing place, race course. And I bet you have seen a racehorse stadium before if you have seen the movie Ben-Hur, not being hot, where Charlton Huston, Heston, he was on this chariot with four horses on the chariot. So it's called a quadrica. A quadrica is a chariot with four horses abreast. The four horses were like this. Instead of having two and the two in front of the carriage, that is a quadrica with four horses in one row. And this is a hippodrome I saw in Israel, Caesarea. Uh, this is a, a big, big uh, Roman ruin where we came in from this end. Our bus stopped here and we came here and we saw the, uh, the theater first. Then we came over and saw the living quarter of the king and the swimming pool. And this huge thing is the hippodrome where they used to race horses. And then we went to the castle that, uh, that way. So this picture was taken from the sky somehow. somehow. Uh, it was not my picture. And I put a star here. Uh, just about everything in my class, if you see a picture, it's from Wikipedia. Uh, only a few were, were mine, like this one. And this one I took in Olympia. And this one is uh, Istanbul. More, more people have been to Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey, than they have been in other countries like uh, Greek, Greece or what's other. Anyway, so uh, you probably remember this place, but you could not tell it is a hippodrome. On the map, it is called a hippodrome, but since Constantine, it's been 300, I mean, it's been 2,300 years, so it's no longer a hippodrome. You could not see a trace of it, but you could see three obelisks from Egypt. They carry these things from Egypt and put it up in this original hippodrome. So when you first go there, they say, oh, let's go to the hippodrome. You wonder what? Why is this a hippodrome? That's why. And the last word, I'm glad we're coming to the last word, is called the moonshine. Moonshine is a fei fa sheng chan zi jia niang zao gao jiu jing du de zheng liu jiu. Isn't that much easier to say moonshine? So it's a private or illicit uh, liquor that's from the distillation, which is zheng liu. Huh? You make the wine, then you distill it. And you only take the distilled part to drink. Uh, so it has a high alcoholic content. Uh, but most of them are illegal. Of course, nowadays there are a lot of legal brands, but there was a time during the, you know, the abolition when it was totally illegal to buy or sell or drink or give away or whatever. So during the abolition, which means prohibit, uh, liquor is a prohibited. It was, okay. It's prohibition, not abolition. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're right. You're right. It's called prohibition. That means to prohibit. Abolition means to make it go away. Huh? Abolition is uh, uh, people who want to get a get rid of uh, slavery, that's called abolitionist. But today we're talking about prohibition, okay. Uh, so that's the moonshine, but of course, uh, since there's no prohibition now, uh, maybe you can, do, you can do that at home, but it's illegal in United States and in many other countries, unless you are registered uh, legal uh, liquor manufacturer or brewery or Distill, distillery. Uh, uh, if you want to go to a small town, you want to see what they have, you would go to Ad, Trip Advisor, and it will tell you all the attractions in this tiny town that you probably could not find out 
by asking your friends. And usually, for example, in Washington State, if you want to go to Lacana, if you want to go to Fairhaven, you go to TripAdvisor and it will show you many breweries which makes which make beer and many distilleries which make whiskey. Uh, so you if you go, uh, of course, there are a wine, wine, it could call a wine brewery, but it's not a distillery because distillery, you have to go through the, dist, uh, you know, Zheng Liu, huh? you have to distill the product in order to get that high quality, high alcoholic content. But for wine and beer, you just drink them as they are finished. So that's this word is called illicit, which means not legal. And distill is Zheng Liu, and spirit is uh, Jiu Jing Ha. And of course, you say you go to a, a liquor store, you see shelves and shelves of privately owned product. That's because they were registered. They are not making it at home. If you make it at home, it's called a moonshine and it's illegal. Uh, America is famous for their, for her bourbon whiskey. Huh? Each country has a whiskey that are particular to them. So in Scotland, it's called scotch. And in America, it's called bourbon whiskey. Yeah, in Ireland, it's called a different whiskey. They, they even spell the word differently without the E. Uh, so this are the, uh, these are like, a, they, they're all produced uh, in Kentucky. We can see from the picture, uh, Jack Daniel and uh, Jim Beam. These are two very famous uh, American brands and they are legal. And they call themselves bourbon because they are all produced in Southern United States where it used to belong to France. So in New Orleans and so on, that area people speak, people speak French and they eat French food uh, and they have a lot of French culture there until Jefferson bought the entire area from uh, Napoleon in the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, so they call their whiskey French bourbon, named after the French bourbon dynasty. Uh, these are some pictures. Uh, this is about uh, getting sick or even die because of moonshine, because in the process, there's a possibility of lead co contamination and there's a uh, methanol, which is the, it's a word here. If it contains methanol, you could become blind or something after drinking this. So be very careful. Even the very clean family production can contain this because there, there is a way of uh, distillation involves the car's radiator and the connection would have lead. So the, the liquor can be contaminate, contaminated. Uh, the last word is fatal. Uh, fate is your destiny. And something that's fatal means you're going to die of it. So it means so, so you would die. Uh, something that is fatal, like a fatal wound. You were injured and as a result you would die. Or a disease that is fatal or a, a day that is fatal. Uh, so all these fatal things are means that a person died, uh, a fatal accident. Uh, and then fatality is the noun, and the fatalistic is the adverb of it. Ooh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have this kind of a lovely little song here. Do, do you want me to play it? Maybe not. I'm not going to play it since I have no time for it, okay? Uh, you all have the link, so you can play it yourself. And it's a song by Pat Poon in this movie, April April Love, okay? So, and it's got all the lyrics in it. However, there were some words that are wrong, and I would like to show you what and how they're wrong. Here it says, where no one ever grows much older, 
it says my shoulder on the screen. So you would be wise if you know to correct it to my, uh, to much older. Huh? This is a lovely uh, song. It, has anybody here seen Ap April dressed in her gown of green? She walks in a world of enchantment where no one ever grows much older than 17. It's quite interesting, yeah. April, uh, that was just the beginning, which is a prelude of the song, not the body of, of it. And the body only has two parts. So a April love is for the very young. Every star is a wishing star that shines for you. April love is all the seven wonders. Uh, we know there are seven wonders in the world, including the Giza pyramid and so on. And April love is just such a wonder. It could be counted among the seven wonders. One little kiss can tell you this is true. Uh, here's a wishing star that is probably not a star. When you see a wishing star, you're probably looking at a meteor or a meteor shower. More likely a meteor shower. This is the four hour time elapsed exposure. So they set the camera there and stand there without human manipulation and let it stay there exposing the film for four hours. And they took the picture of a meteor shower. Isn't that interesting? So that is a wishing star. You make a wish when you see a wish a, when you see a, a meteor, it's because it just happened so quickly that you will have very little chance to make that wish. That's what they wish for. Uh, let me see. The, the second stanza is: Sometimes an April day will suddenly bring shower, rain to grow the flowers for her first bouquet. But April love can slip right through your fingers. It comes and goes in a minute. So if she's the one, don't let her go away. Okay? Don't let her run away. Uh, that is a, you know, Pat Poon is a teen idol, or you can say a teen throb, T H R O B, which means a ching chun o xiang, make young girls' heart tremble with happiness or excitement. Uh, that's called the teen throb. Uh, so I said wishing star is not a star. It could be a comet which takes forever to go through to pass your head. So it cannot be a comet. And uh, it's more likely a meteor, which means shoo, it's gone. And in order for you to see a lot of meteor, it will be better if it's uh, during a meteor shower which means you see meteor shooting left and right all over the place quite frequently. That's called the meteor shower, as if you are taking a shower. And the most famous meteor showers are Perseids and Leonids. Now, they are all named with IDS at the end and with the constellations name in front. In this case, we have Perseus, who is a Greek hero, and there's a constellation named after Perseus, which we call the Shen, uh, Shen, the Chan Jia de Chan. You would pronounce it as Shen, uh, Shen Xing. And Leonid is, of course, from Lion, uh, the constellation called the Leo, Leon or Leo. Uh, when you see a meteor shower that is coming from that radiant point, which means the radiant. The, this meteor shower seems to be coming from one specific specific point in the sky. That's the radiant of in the sky of the meteor shower. And it's usually named after a constellation that is close by. Uh, so constellation, we, we already learned some uh, last time, which is a Xingzuo constellation, probably. I hope it's right. Uh, so you have constellation and then you have a group stars that's called a constellation and the per se, per, Perseus would be the star in this constellation that's one of the brightest. 
Okay, so we have this and uh, this. Oh, we'll go over it quickly. Huh? This is a movie. We call it Si Chang Wei Chu Chu Kai. And it's, the song is very famous and it put Pat Poon on the chart. And the Pat Poon was famous in the 1950s, only second to Elvis Presley. So he's he was tremendously popular. And he had a record that was not broken until 2010. The record that is that she, he had uh, one or another of his songs was on the chart. That is a po the popular, the top, top 40 chart for, for uh, the weekly chart for 220 weeks. He had one or other songs on the top 40 chart for 220 weeks. That's a quite amazing uh, streak of uh, popularity that the record was broken in 2010. Uh, this is Pat Boone, a very clean cut young man, even though he was married at the time. And it was said that in this movie, he did not really kiss Shirley Jones because he was married and he did not want to make his wife unhappy. And of course, you can see him getting very old now. And here's Shirley Jones, is also a very wholesome looking, young, delightful girl. And later on, after she made many popular movies, she went on to TV to become the leading character in this show called The, the Partridge Family. She played a, a widow with five kids and together they form a band. And the second most famous people in that picture is a young boy uh, at the top who played the oldest kid. And he's played by David Cassidy, who is uh, Shirley Jones' stepson. She is loved by many, many people. She was the uh, leading actress in Oklahoma, Carousel, and The Music Man, and the leading character in Partridge Family, which is a situation comedy. Uh, we have a name for a TV series called Situation Comedy. In United States English, you would call such a series as sitcom, S-I-T, sitcom it's short for situation comedy that means uh, uh, for example a tv series uh, like colombo it would have one story each time you will see colombo breaking a case a mysterious murder and at the end he would find uh, the villain the murderer but uh, there are series that are not dramatic series they are situation comedies like friends or Partridge family, each one will have a story about this subject, the people or group of family, and something happened in uh, one day in their life. So you watch a situation comedy because you want to watch a comedy, not because you want to solve a murder kiss, his, uh, his uh, mystery, or you want to watch some story from beginning to the end, but you just want to laugh and look at people, how they go along in their life. That's called the situation comedy. And here's a picture when Shirley Jones was much older. Oh, I forgot to mention that she got the Oscar for Elmer Gantry. That was uh, uh, the leading character was uh, played by Burt Lancaster. He was playing Elmer Gantry. And the story was written by Sinclair Lewis, who was the first writer in America to win uh, a Nobel Prize in literature. Uh, so that's a, a pretty important uh, landmark movie. But she played a minor role. She was always a healthy, happy, good person. But in this movie, she was uh, a prostitute. Uh, it seems that. Uh, many, many women who won an Oscar were playing a prostitute because just by playing an ordinary, happy, healthy person is not good enough role for you to show your acting skill. Okay, the next one is uh, Xingming, huh? it's uh, by Du Mu. 
，清明时节雨纷纷，路上行人欲断魂。借问酒家何处有？牧童遥指杏花村。Uh, it's a very simple one, and I bet most of you have come across this poem before. And I picked it because it's also about springtime when it was raining and uh, uh, in this case, it's not about uh, spring love, not about teenagers. It's about probably a, a person after his peak, the, the top of his life was over and he was quite uh, uh, in disgrace or in uh, distress. So he's writing this, trying to get some wine to drink to numb himself because uh, even though the season is so beautiful and the spring flowers and leaves are all over the place, he's not in a good place. Huh? Uh, Qingming is a, we call it a solar term. Huh? We have, we Chinese have 24 solar terms on our calendar that marks the season. And because it marks the season for farmers to plant, all these terms are uh, packed to certain time of the year according to the sun. So when you say Chinese calendar and imagining that was a lunar calendar, you are wrong because a Chinese calendar is not a lunar calendar. It's a combination of a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. So it's called a Soli lunar or lunar soli, I forgot. So you would combine the two words, the solar and the lunar together to form the part of the word that is the Chinese calendar. So it's not going by the moon strictly because the 24 solar terms on the Chinese calendar is totally separate from the lunar calendar. It's not according to the lunar calendar. And I talked about it probably in the second or third class that would probably be in March of the last year. Uh, so during this time, it is usually April 4th or April 5th, depending on uh, the sun or the leap day. Uh, so this is the Qingming festival and it's uh, raining all the time. And uh, when you walk on the road or streets, you see people are quite out of their element because uh, the, the rain is very much bothering people. Uh, he is thinking that he himself, as if his uh, spirit is totally gone. Huh? So his uh, spirit was uh, savored. Huh? We use the word savor. Uh, maybe many other people were not so, but when he was feeling terrible in his mind or in his eyes, he thought everyone on the road or on the street are also experiencing some bad things in their lives. They're not, they don't look good, okay? So in order to get some relief, he asked somebody, huh? is sometimes when we ask something, we would uh, politely say, may I borrow your time to ask you this question? Huh? That's what it means, you. Where can I find a bar or the pub, a place where I can buy drinks? And of course the person he accosted, he asked the question, is a, a cowboy. Now, when we say a cowboy, we do mean a boy who takes care of a cow and the boy should be much younger than the American cowboys. They should uh, just be leading the cow in and out of the ranch and so on. So they don't do much work. They are cheap laborers. Usually they don't get paid just because they're doing that for their parents. So this cowboy uh, waved to him, pointed to him 
a very far away village, which is called Xinhua Chun. Ah, Mu Tong Yao Zhi Xinhua Chun is a, this a cowboy he came across would point uh, to the uh, apricot blossom village that is some distance from him. Uh, he, here I have some uh, pictures, but I think that is the end of it. This is where we had this uh, uh, 24 uh, solar terms around the calendar. They are exactly 24. And in fact, they are now considered uh, a world heritage, uh, intangible cultural heritage registered with the United Nations now. Okay, the, the, this is a, yeah, yeah, I was telling you I was coming to the word equinox and the solstice. Uh, these are Xia Zhi and Dong Shu, and these are Chun Fen and Qiu Fen with the word equinox. Okay. And this guy is called Mu Du Mu uh, in the ninth century, about 49th, 49 years old, the Shanxi Ren. We call him Xiao Du. And his poems were collected in eight volumes of Quan Tang Shi. Last time we talked about this poem, poet who only had uh, six poems collected. But here, one volume could mean hundreds of poems, and eight volumes would be a sizable collection of poems written by Du Mu. And many of his poems were very, very popular. I would say even more popular than many others, proportionally speaking, because he did not write so many, but many of them are so popular, like this Yuan Shang Han Shan Shi Jin Xie. You can see that he's using very simple words and it evokes such a feeling and a visual effect in your mind. You were just moved by what he's saying. It's a very simple thing with, that, with no hard story or words, but it just gives you immediately a huge feeling of identification. And this is a story with Zheji Chen Xia, Chen Sha Tie Wei Xiao, Zi Jiang Mo Xi Ren Qian Chao. So he was at Chi Bi, the Red Cliffs, where Zhuge Liang had a, a huge battle with Cao Cao, along with uh, Zhou Yu. And Zhou Feng, uh, Dong Feng Bu Yu, Zhou Lang Bian, Tong Qie, Chun Shen, Suo Er Qiao. Uh, you have Da Qiao and Xiao Qiao. There are two sisters who married Sun Quan and uh, probably Sun Ce. I don't know. Uh, so if they lose the battle, uh, they're doomed. Uh, all Liu Bei and uh, Sun Quan would both lose their country. Uh, so it's thank goodness for their good fortune that Cao Cao lost in this huge battle. Uh, this is very much in our blood. We all Chinese know very well the story of them. Jiang Nan Chun, Qian Li Ying Ti Lu Ying Hong, Shui Chun Shan Guo Jiu Qi Feng. So he's quite a drinker. Nan Chao Si Dai Ba Shi Si. Uh, these are the Buddhist temples, 480 temples in Nan Chao, the Southern Dynasty, because the one after another, all Southern Dynasty had their capital in Nanjing. It's always Yan Yu or rain or something. It's moving like this one, Yan Long Han Shui, Yue Long Sha, Ye Bo Qing Huai Jin Jiu Jia. And this is uh, lamenting that the, 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 the country le was uh, chased away from the north by Liao and the Jin. Is that so? I don't know. Yeah, he was in town. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, I'm confused. Uh, this looks like he was in the Southern Dynasty, okay? Shangnu Bu Zhi Wang Guo Hen. So it must be talking about some other time other than his. Ge Jiang Yu Chang Ho Ting Hua. And this is about uh, 
the seventh day of the seventh moon in the lunar calendar about uh, uh, Valentine's Day. 银烛秋光冷画屏，星落小山铺流萤。天阶夜色凉如水，我看牵牛织女心。He just gives you this vivid picture of what's going on. You can see the candles and the lightning bugs, and uh, uh, looking at the Milky Way and feeling cool in the evening because it, it was a summer day, probably late summer. And this is the last one I'm going to read.、Uh, du Mu was a, a resident of Yangzhou for many, many years, and this one, the Yangzhou Ren, pro, particularly loved this one. It's Qing Shan Yin Yin Shui Diao Shui Tiao Tiao. It is Tiao Tiao. I need to change that. Qiu Jin Jiang Nan Cao Wei Diao, 二十四桥明月夜，与人何处教吹箫。If you've been to Yangzhou, which is a lovely place to visit, there so many wonderful places to see. Even after we stay stay there for many days, there's more to see that we didn't touch. And they've got a huge museum, very good museum. And Arshisuqiao is, of course, at Shouxihu. There is a bridge called the Twenty Four Bridge. They say it's because. It was、uh, maybe 24 meters long, or maybe has 24、uh, balustrade and so on and so forth. But this is just one bridge that's called 24 bridge. Now、uh, you, I would recommend you to take、uh, not a cruise, it just、uh, yeah, they they call it a cruise in a small boat and just wander on this lake. It goes on and on with peach blossoms. And、uh, willow trees. If you want to see the beautiful things in south of、uh, Yangtze River, you ought to go to Yangzhou.、Oh, <laughs> excuse me, Yangzhou is north of the river. But if you want to go to、uh, Yangtze River at the delta, Yangzhou is the point you have to go to.、Uh, it happens to be north of Yangzhou、uh, of Yangzhejiang. And、uh, Hangzhou and、uh, Nanjing, etc. They were south of the river.、Huh? In China, when you say the river, that means the Yangtze River. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I'm sorry, it took so much time, but I can't help it because this is a lovely poet. I love him to death. <laughs> Thank you, teacher. Yeah, <laughs> 不客气，不客气。